and private vessels, including NGO rescue vessels, be obliged to disembark rescued people in places which are unsafe? We believe that we have to raise and answer these questions in order to discuss the EU's current and future role in the Mediterranean. We would also like to thank um, uh, Eric Marquardt, uh, member of the European Parliament and his advisor, Stephanie Sift, for their excellent cooperation. And of course, we would like to thank the authors for their great efforts. We hope that the findings of this study will contribute to a fact-based discussion regarding the EU's responsibility and obligation to rescue and receive persons who are in distress at sea. Last not least, I would like to thank my colleague Anna Schwarz, who has coordinated this project with a high level of commitment. Anna will also moderate uh, the discussion. And this is why I will pass the floor to Anna now. I would also like to thank you for coming. We are really very pleased that the interest in, in this <coughs> event is um, so high. And I'm now looking forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you, Eva. Um, for working? Yes. Yeah? yeah? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, also, a very warm welcome from, from me. Um, I'm very happy to see so many people in the room today. Um, I would like to invite those of you who are in the background to just take a seat uh, somewhere. You don't have to stand. Um, take your time, yeah. but <laughs> there's enough uh, room for everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to moderate today's presentation of the study, Places of Safety in the Mediterranean, the EU's Policy of Outsourcing Responsibility. It has been a process of, uh, well, over six months now, I think, um, from our initial idea for the study to, yeah, to today. Um, and by reading and also um, coordinating the study, I myself learned already a lot. <laughs> and. Um, in order to not make you wait any longer for the presentation, I would like to introduce the two authors of the study, Professor Anushi Farahat and Professor Nura Markat. Anushi Farahat is a professor of public law, migration law, and human rights law at the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg. Since 2017, she leads an Emmy Noether research group on the role of constitutional courts and transnational solidarity conflicts in Europe first at the Goethe University in Frankfurt and now at the University of Erlangen-Nürnberg. Um, Anushi Farah had received her PhD from the Goethe University in Frankfurt and she publishes widely um, on issues of European and German constitutional law, German and international migration and citizenship law, international human rights law and comparative constitutionalism. <coughs> Nora Markart, um, is a professor of international public law and international human rights at the University of Münster. She is um, a co-founder of the human of the Humboldt Law Clinic, Human and Fundamental Rights, and of the Refugee Law Clinic Hamburg, and advises the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights on its migration and gender litigation. She holds a PhD from Humboldt University and. She has well published widely <laughs> on international and constitutional law issues um, with a focus on inequality and forced migration. And without further ado, I would like now to give the floor to you two for the presentation. All right, we'll do this together since we wrote this together. Um, I want to start with um, our great slides. Um, the Mediterranean continues to be deadly. Um, many of you may oops, know this uh, this great image. Whoever made this, you're a genius. Can we please have a new one? This one's from 2014. So I made my own with numbers from um, IOM's Missing Migrants Project. And as you see, uh, IOM reported over 1,800 people drowned in the Mediterranean last year, many more than in other parts of the world. And this number is lower than in the last years. Um, in 2016, we had over 5,000 people drown in the Mediterranean, um, but the number of crossings has also gone down. So the number remains high related to the number of crossings. Now, the international law of the sea contains a duty for any shipmaster 
to render assistance to persons in distress at sea. It also requires that states have effective search and rescue capacities in place. But instead of stepping up rescue efforts, the EU member states have been seeking to limit their responsibility for the lives of migrants at sea by employing three strategies. First, by reducing their own rescue missions and interfering with private rescue missions. Second, by asking private shipmasters who do manage to rescue people at sea to disembark the survivors in northern African ports, including Libya. And third, by calling upon third countries, including Libya in northern Africa, for rescues in the Mediterranean. This, of course, is part of a larger strategy to shift protection responsibilities to third countries and uh, keeping migrants away from the EU's area of freedom, security, and justice. Um, so in our study, we examined this strategy in relation to the duty to rescue and uh, specifically the duty to deliver survivors uh, to a place of safety. So we'll first examine uh, what constitutes a place of safety and whether against these criteria, the five Northern African countries can be considered places of safety. Um, we'll then examine the implications of these findings for three scenarios. First, where state vessels conduct the SAR mission, the search and rescue SAR mission, where private shipmasters come to the rescue, and then where Northern Africa, or African authorities are called to the rescue. So let's start with places of safety. Yes, Nora has already mentioned the um, general duty to um, rescue people in distress uh, according to the law of the sea. And um, according to the law of the sea, that um, obligation, um, that duty to rescue only ends when the rescuer brings the rescued persons to a place of safety. So what does a place of safety constitute? Thank you. Um, so, according to international law, a place of safety is a place where the survivor's safety of life is no longer threatened and where basic human needs are actually met. Basic, what are basic human needs? Basic human needs are things like food, shelter and medical needs. In addition to that, specific needs and vulnerabilities of the persons rescued have to be taken into account. And the principle of non refoulement must be taken into account when deciding uh, whether a place actually constitutes a place of safety or not. These criteria have been developed by the Maritime Security Council of the International Maritime Organization uh, Committee. Sorry. So if there is no um, security or no safety from death, abuse, persecution or chain refoulement, then a place cannot be considered to, play, to be uh, a place of safety. What does that mean now for the concrete situation in the North African countries. Libya, according to these criteria, can certainly not be considered a place of safety. Migrants disembarked in Libya are typically transferred to deten detention centers where they face arbitrary detention in inhuman conditions and continue to be subjected to torture, including rape and other forms of sexual violence. Uh, in addition, they face forced labor, forced, uh, forced prostitution, and unlawful killings. The EU presidency has confirmed the precarious and unbearable conditions in which migrants are held in Libya and recognized that the camps there are overcrowded and that water and food supply is not guaranteed, that sanitary conditions are appalling and acts of violence against rescued persons occur regularly. The situation in Libya, therefore, is such that it can under no circumstances be considered a place of safety. The situation in Morocco and Tunisia, as well as in Algeria and Egypt, is different, but these countries can also not be considered to be safe in general. In these countries, particularly vulnerable groups, in particular migrants, women, LGBT, children or members of a particular religious group are exposed to severe discrimination, harassment, use of force by state authorities, torture or ill treatment, as well as arbitrary detention. In addition, unlawful deportation, violation of non refoulement and chain refoulement are documented, particularly in Egypt and Tunisia. Moreover, um, Morocco and, and Tunisia don't have a proper asylum system uh, at all. 
Those countries, therefore, may not be unsafe for each and every, refu every, every person rescued, but at least for many. However, as exercising a screening on board is not feasible, and certain, at least certainly not for private rescuers, those countries cannot be considered to be places of safety under international law of the sea. As Nora also mentioned, under international, under international law, states are not only obliged to rescue persons in distress, but also obliged to provide effective search and rescue services and to coordinate rescue operations. The reality, however, is quite different. Instead of doing so, EU member states try to circumvent their human rights obligations at sea by shifting rescue duties to Libya and other North African countries, which cannot consider it to be safe. So now starting from the insight that um, Libya is under no condition a safe country, a safe place in the sense of the law of the sea, and that um, the other North African countries cannot generally be considered places of safety for all um, survivors of a case of distress. What does that mean for the three rescue scenarios um, that I mentioned before? Uh, rescue by state authorities, rescue by private parties, and finally the use of proxy states such as Libya. I want to start with the first um, scenario, which is relatively straightforward, where state authorities, be it uh, member state uh, vessels or in the course of a Frontex operation, um, thank you, um, conduct the search and rescue mission. In those cases, uh, obviously, since they are state authorities, they are directly bound by the law of the sea, so they must disembark the, sur the survivors in a place of safety. Um, in addition, of course, they are bound by the non refoulement gu guarantee, so they are not allowed to be sending back uh, individuals to places where um, they are either threatened with pers persecution or where they will be sent back to a place where they will be persecuted, or under human rights law where they face uh, torture or inhuman or degrading treatment. This human rights obligation, watch out. <laughs> this human rights obligation uh, comes with a procedural obligation. Um, any person um, must have a chance to have their individual protection claim examined. Otherwise, sending them back uh, in a group would violate the prohibition of collective expulsions under the European Convention on, on Human Rights. Um, this is what the European Court of Human Rights uh, decided in 2011 in the case of Hirsi Jama and others versus Italy. This is actually a picture of the facts underlying that case. On the left side, you see uh, Italian border forces. I'm actually not sure on the left or the right side, sorry. But uh, on the one side, you see Italian uh, border forces handing over a person to the Libyans on the other side, who will then detain these people and expose them to the conditions that Anushi has so uh, graphically described. Um, so in that case, the court made clear that these guarantees, the human rights guarantees, also apply at sea whenever a convention state exercises jurisdiction over a person. Um, in its disastrous grand chamber decision uh, on hot returns in the Spanish enclave uh, of Melilla, um, the court has very recently made it clear that these principles stand. This is a case on land borders, and it has repeatedly emphasized that Hirsi has not been overruled. There is still no, no law zone in the Mediterranean. Okay. Um, compared to the situation where uh, member states themselves uh, are uh, in charge of rescuing um, persons in distress, the situation is quite more difficult uh, in regard to private rescuers, is the situation that I would like to um, elaborate on now. So uh, in case of private rescuers, the state obligation to coordinate and rescue and to find places of safety links with the duties of bri private shipmasters. International law not only addresses states, but in the case of rescue at sea, it also directly addresses private shipmasters. According to international law of the sea, every master of a ship is bound so far as he can do without serious danger to his vessel and persons thereon to render assistance to any person in danger um, of being lost at sea. So private ship masters must rescue, rescue persons and must deliver rescuees then to a place of safety. 
At the same time, member states have to establish maritime rescue and coordination centers, so-called MRCCs, to ensure effective coordination of rescue operations in their search and rescue zones. Private shipmasters are typically obliged by domestic law both to follow MRCC instructions and to rescue persons in distress at sea. That means domestic um, um, so, and uh, that means that a shipmaster may, might, make, might be confronted with a situation where he has, where he's facing contradicting obligations. On the one hand, the duty to deliver rescues to a place of safety, and on the other hand, the duty to follow MRCC instructions, which, mi which might instruct him to actually bring um, the rescuees to an unsafe place in North African countries. However, the domestic obligation to follow MRCC instructions must be read in the light of the duty to rescue. So the whole reason why we have that obligation to follow MRCC instructions uh, for private shipmasters is that um, the duty to rescue should operate effectively so that private shipmasters, um, even if it's not in their own interest, um, are really bound, effectively bound to, um, to then uh, rescue the persons in distress. Therefore, if an MRCC indicates no place of safety, it's always safety first. Private shipmasters may argue that they cannot be obliged by member states to deliver a person to a place that is not safety. Moreover, states violate the law of the sea and human rights if they instruct private shipmasters to disembark rescuees at Libya or other unsafe places. Under the principles of state responsibility, States can be held accountable for private actions if they instruct pr if the private person has acted under the instruction of a state. This is clearly the case where an MRCC instructs a private shipmaster to bring refugees to an unsafe place where their human rights are violated, and arguably it's even the case where a flag states um, where a flag state instructs ships flying as flag to comply with MRCC instructions that violate law of the sea or human rights obligations. All right, that brings us to the third and last scenario, um, search and rescue by proxy states. This is a photo that shows how the Libyan Coast Guard, which you see in the front, uh, the Libyan flag is unfortunately cut off in this photo. This is the only one I could find um, that uh, is interfering with a rescue operation that is ongoing uh, being conducted by the Sea Watch 3, which you see in the background. Um, so the problem here is um, that uh, proxy states, proxy for EU member states from Northern Africa, third countries from the EU perspective, are being called to a rescue scene in order to um, then conduct the SARA mission and take those people back to um, usually their own ports. Um, Libya has, with massive financial support from the EU Commission's Trust Fund for Africa, um, channeled through Italy, um, established a search and rescue region. Um, however, it still has no operational rescue coordination center that is still being set up. Um, meanwhile, the Italian MRCC in Rome is functioning as the regional coordination center. Um, and the future Joint Ref uh, Rescue Coordination Center Libya is uh, for now functioning as a sub-regional center. So that means MRCC Rome is, uh, is um, communicating regularly with the Libyan Coast Guard and is often transmitting information on distress cases to Libya, which then sends the Libyan Coast Guard to the rescue, brings survivors back to Libya, thereby violating the law of the sea duty to disembark them in a place of safety. Libya is not a place of safety and often committing severe abuse or endangering lives of migrants in the process. Um, now, as we saw in the first scenario, if the Italian Coast Guards did that themselves, delivered um, the rescuees to Libya themselves, they would violate the same duties, law of the sea duties, as well as um, human rights duties. Um, now, the question is, can they avoid responsibility by having Libya do it for them? And our answer is no. Um, on several grounds. First of all, um, 
the Italian government would be complicit with a Libyan violation of the law of the sea. Complicity is another ground for state responsibility under the Articles of State Responsibility. Um, and such complicity is present when a state lends aid or assistance to another state, and thus that type of support does not actually have to be essential. Examples include um, delivery of arms supplies or logistics support or intelligence. Um, if this aid or assistance is provided with knowledge of the circumstances and the situation in Libya is well known, we know that the Libyan Coast Guards will take the people back to Libya and we know how they will be treated there. Um, that is well known to Italy as well. And third, um, such aid or assistance with knowledge um, leads to responsibility if the state lending aid or assistance would also be committing a violation of international law if that state acted directly. And as I said, that is also the case for Italy. So in these law of the sea uh, violations, Italy is complicit when they call Libya as a proxy. And of course, the MRCC is violating its law of the sea duty to protect um, survivors by handing them over um, to an unsafe place. Now, um, I mentioned earlier the human rights guarantee um, that the European Court uh, established in the hearsay judgment or sort of um, officially expanded to the high seas and said if the Italian Coast Guards acted directly, they would also be violating non refoulement So my second question is, can involving Libya also constitute a human, ri human rights violation by Italy? Now, that is a situation that the European Court of Rights hasn't addressed so far. There are cases pending. It may address them in the future. But for now, we have to proceed with the jurisprudence that we have in different scenarios and see how they would apply to this case. Um, so normally, um, European human, uh, Convention of Human Rights obligations outside a state's territory require effective control either over foreign territory or over the person. Um, control and authority over an individual is what the court has been calling this recently. That's the situation we had in Hirsi when the government, the Italian sort of uh, forces, were taking the migrants uh, on board, putting them on their ship, and then conducting them to Libya and then disembarking them there. This is not the situation, obviously, that we have here because it's Libyan forces that are acting. But um, control, the court has said, also exists if a state has decisive influence over a subordinate local administration. Um, arguably, that um, can be extended to our case here, at least, um, by, use, by relying on the court's rationale that a local administration only survives because of that support. And as I said, Libya's search and rescue mission basically is funded by, Italy, by Italian and EU money. Uh, and in another situation, the court has what my colleague Violetta moreno Lax has called contactless control. Um, when a state's, and I'm quoting here, power to issue decisions or to take action with extraterritorial effect is based on international legal obligations. Now here we have Italy's power to take decisions or take action based on its law of the sea obligation as the state that is conducting this or that is sort of operating the search and rescue region and coordinating rescue missions with extraterritorial effect, of course, in the Mediterranean. So there are very good reasons to think that the European Convention on Human Rights is, is also violated in these scenarios. Um, accordingly, the Commissioner for Human Rights of the Council of Europe assumes that when cooperating with or transferring coordination to Libya, I quote, um, states fully retain their own responsibility for the preservation of life at sea and the respect of the non refoulement obligation, end of quote. This means that when cooperating with unsafe proxy states, EU member states are not only complicit in violations of the law of the sea, but they also risk responsibility for human rights violations. And of course, as Anoshi has already explained, if the MRCC in this type of situation tells private shipmasters to stop rescuing, 
there is again a conflict of duties between following the MRCC instructions and following the duty to rescue people in distress at sea and deliver them to a place of safety. And in those cases, we argue it's safety first. The duty to obey the MRCC serves to strengthen SAR operations, not to weaken them. Okay. So the obligation to rescue at sea, um, as we have argued in our study, includes the duty to deliver persons that have been rescued to a place of safety. And law of the sea requires to take into account the human rights situation and in particular the situation uh, of refugees at the place of disembarca disembarkation when determining the places of safety. North African countries, as we have seen, cannot generally be considered places of safety. In particularly, Libya cannot be considered a place of safety under any circumstances due to the devastating detention conditions, torture, frequent violence and arbitrary killings that occur there. And while the situation in other North African countries may be less devastating, they are also no places of safety, at least for many groups of rescuees. Nevertheless, EU member states have been seeking to shift their responsibility for rescued migrants to North African states by promoting disembarkation there. We have uh, analyzed three different constellations. So first of all, disembarkation by member state officials, and then the um, responsibility for instructing private shipmasters to disembark in North Africa or to stand by in a rescue situation. And Finally, the disembarkation by proxy states. In all three constellations, EU member states can be held accountable for violation of the law of the seas and human rights. In the first constellation, they directly violate the duty to rescue, but also the uh, prohibition of collective expulsion and in many cases also the principle of non refoulement in the second constellation, if they instruct private shipmasters to return rescuees to an unsafe place, member states may be held accountable for instructing private persons to an, uh, in, uh, private persons to an internationally wrongful act. And in the third constellation, member states can be held accountable for complicity where they are calling upon coast guards of North African countries to perform rescue and to return persons to North Africa while asking private rescuers to stand by. Member states must therefore immediately stop instructing private vessels to disembark rescuees in unsafe places in North Africa and must also stop calling upon third country authorities to achieve this effect. Instead, Member states have to comply with their duties under international law of the sea and human rights obligations by providing safe access to protection and, fair and a fair and effective asylum procedure in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nura and Anushi, for this very good insight into the study. Um, I would now like to introduce Eric, Eric Marquardt, who will provide us with um, an assessment of the political dimensions resulting from, from the findings of the study. Um, Eric is a member of the European Parliament and the spokesperson of the German Greens in the European Parliament on Asylum and Migration. Before he engaged in politics, um, Eric worked as a photojournalist documenting the situation of refugees on the Balkan route in Greece and also in the Mediterranean. He has organized many exhibitions and presentations to illustrate the situation of refugees to and to promote greater understanding for the situation. And he has also been involved in rescuing people on the Mediterranean and supports NGOs and engaged in the uh, search and rescue missions in the Mediterranean. So Eric, after this um, presentation, and of course you also read the study before this presentation, <laughs> um, I would like to ask you to share your thoughts with us. Um, which implications have the findings of the study for European policies and also which is most interesting for me at least, um, which concrete measures are to be taken now? Yeah, I, um, first I want to thank you for the invitation and the possibility to 
write something in this um, very, very, very uh, important and nice study. And also, I wanted to thank you for the um, yeah presentation, and writing of the study. I think that I have like lots of thoughts about it. In general, I would say that the whole discussion about search and rescue is pretty disappointing at the moment um, from a political point of view. Uh, we have a situation where several member states. Do are doing everything to prevent that efficient search and rescue missions are provided in the central Mediterranean. It's not only the lack of a um, European search and rescue mission, but also the pressure on NGOs. And as we heard, um, they are also doing everything to outsource their responsibility. And we have the situation that we have a very clear judgment in 2011, which said Italy, you are not allowed to bring back people to Libya. And I maybe like the expectation is very high but i would expect from a european union member states of the european union like italy but also the others to not say okay there is a judgment saying we're breaking humanitarian law so we try to find loopholes and organize a situation where maybe others can break the law for us because we are not like um, happy with the with the um, European Convention of Human Rights, and we find, uh, for example, Islamist militias in Libya who maybe break the law for us. And um, I think the, like one of the main findings of the study, which is, in my opinion, very important, is that the situation, these pushbacks by proxy, are just not lawful. And it's also, um, I think, very interesting for the European Commission because the European Commission don't have to wait anymore for judgments from the European Court of Human Rights, but can start uh, infringement procedures now. That's, um, I think, very helpful information from the study. And I think it's also a very important thing for a new commission to, um, also as a guardian of the treaty, to yeah, um, find some problems and um, also organize some consequences if there are problems um, with member states. I think that we also have a situation um, that we do not hear so much about Libya, about Northern Africa. We are lucky we hear something from the central Mediterranean if there are vessels from, for example, NGOs. But I think the second thing which is very important um, with the study is that we focus a little bit more on the area where people come from and why they are leaving the countries. We have a huge discussion about uh, relocation mechanisms and whatever, but in the end it's a humanitarian crisis we have as a central Mediterranean and people are not like just stepping on a boat which is very dangerous um, because they have nothing else to do in their lives, but because they are fleeing from a war zone in Libya or torture or slavery or whatever. And I am pretty also disappointed that we do not link the situation in Libya to the discussion what we have to do in the central Mediterranean. We are asking all the parties engaged in the war in Libya to respect humanitarian um, um, aid and whatever, but we are doing everything to prevent that we are helping the people who are free, fleeing from Libya. And I think it's also very important that we, for example, in this discussion um, about the uh, Oinofa Met Mission Sophia, not only um, talking about an uh, embargo of weapons, but also understand that a humanitarian crisis is, is nothing we can talk about for years and talk about relocation mechanisms and the new pact for asylum and migration. It's an important discussion and we can have different opinions on that, but we should have one opinion if people are in danger and in distress that we rescue first and then we can talk about everything um, else later. I think that is something we also learned in the um, yeah, um, 20th century in the European Union that it is very important to respect the dignity of every person in the end. And that is not like a hypermolized discussion or whatever, but the basis on which the European Union is built on. And I think it's also like very important thing that I would like expect from at least some governments in the European Union to be a little bit more proud of the basic values of the European Union and to step forward. So I would also say that um, at least some member states can um, do something now uh, and it's not necessary to um, negotiate a consensus with all the member states and with Hungary and with Mr. Orban to act uh, when we see a humanitarian crisis. Um, that's like maybe, yeah.
we discuss later more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, as I know that there are very many people among you that have a lot of expertise in the field, I would like to open the floor as soon as possible to your questions and comments. So uh, you can already think of good questions and comments. Um, but as I have the uh, still have the microphone, I want to ask uh, Eric another question. Um, so, I mean, we we heard a lot about the current situation, and you also touched upon it and um, you said we need a relocation mechanism but before we discuss that we need to like to save people save lives but in a situation like the one we are in where civil rescue vessels are not allowed to enter European harbors or have problems to get the permission and where there is no working um, relocation mechanism at the moment because certain member states block it in the council. H like, w what is the biggest challenge for you to to tackle that and to um, achieve a change of policies? <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, if I said in the beginning that uh, the study also maybe helps to find back to a factful discussion about things and I think one of the main things is that we have to focus on facts and I'm also disappointed by some like people in governments and member states who are just focusing on how to gain some political capital out of the problem and not solving the solution I think um, for example the rise of the far right is not because we have a big migration crisis at the moment if you look at the numbers we don't have we have a really big lack of politicians who are able to deal with challenges, find solutions and just um, deal with uh, migration in the 21st century. We discussed migration like it's the biggest problem in the world if a three-year-old child arrives at, uh, at in Italy alive. Yeah? That's like not a situation um, where I can, yeah, where I'm happy with, but I also think that this problem-based discussion is a little bit far away from reality because we have many local and regional authorities to actually say we we would like to accept refugees to welcome them please let us and member states are actually also preventing that people who want to show their solidarity local and regional authorities who want to show their solidarity um, are able to do it and if we maybe want to have one first step to also change the discussion, it would be a great achievement if local and regional authorities are supported by the European Union financially, but also by law that it is maybe uh, possible for them to do to help uh, if they want to help. That would be a big first step in my opinion. And I think that also the discussion on the new pact on asylum and migration should focus a little bit more on the possibilities we have at the moment in the first step than only talking about the problems we maybe have with uh, Hungary. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So this is the moment where you all come in. <laughs> um, Carlotta is going to take the microphone. And um, I already see one question here. Uh, I, I suggest that we collect some questions and then give the panelists uh, the chance to react on them. And please uh, state your name and, and also maybe your professional background. I saw one question here, then I saw Josephine and the gentleman um, in the blue. Hello, Pullover. I'm Maria Laura Franciosi, a journalist from uh, Italy. Um, nobody has mentioned here the, the Dublin Convention. And that is the big... Uh, <laughs> skeleton <laughs> in the cupboard because in fact uh, I, I'm not justifying what has been happening in Italy it's disgusting because as somebody said it's been uh, they used the, the, the migrants uh, for their political uh, uh, benefit um, but in fact the responsibility is uh, collective <laughs> for the whole of Europe because Dublin is, is there, uh, and uh, the, 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 the country, the first arrival country, etc. Oh, we know very well what Dublin says. So uh, this, this is um, an enormous problem that 
affects the whole of Europe. And I agree, and the, the study is ex excellent, because in fact, you mention all <laughs> the intervention of the Court of Human Rights and the Council of Europe, etc. But there is this big Dublin issue. And uh, as long as we, s we still have the problem, uh, it won't be solved, unfortunately. Thank you very much. My name is Josephine uh, Liebel. I work for ECRE, which is the European Council on Refugees and Exiles. Uh, thank you very much for the study, um, and thanks uh, a lot for the event. I have a couple of questions. Um, the first relates to the uh, SAR zone in Libya, and I would be interested to hear your comments about the um, decision to expand the SAR zone of Libya, and whether there's any relation between a discussion that happens at the International Maritime Organization to expand the Tsar zone and an assessment of whether the harbors within that Tsar zone are places of safety. Um, and maybe related to that, what or is there responsibility of members who member states who are signatories to the convention who are also part of the International Maritime Organization to make those decisions? Um, the second question also relates to uh, the this idea of uh, search and rescue as proxy, mm -hmm. is whether you have looked at in the study at the role of Frontex and this question of passing on information um, about the whereabouts of ships, and that's something that we and our members are looking at, especially for the purpose um, also of litigation. And then a final uh, reflection or question to all of you is um, to um, hear your comments on the recent uh, decision at the Foreign Affairs Council to change the mandate of Operation Sophia, or uh, the future name, it's not going to be called probably Sophia anymore, but where it all very much goes into that same direction, as in um, ha have ships deployed as far as possible away from uh, the uh, migratory routes on the Libyan coast to not um, be engaged in search and rescue at all. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm writing for the Brussels Times. Uh, Thank you very much for your report. I think it's very clear. But still, I have two, let's say, legal questions that you could clarify about. First, about the definitions. I mean, the crucial concept is obviously place of safety. And then you return to the law of the SEBA. But I often hear about uh, the concept of uh, safe countries of return or, or safe countries of origin in the Asylum Convention. Uh, but my first question is if it is in the difference in the definition of safe place. Uh, and the second question is, when you ask the Commission very often about this and so on, uh, they say they're very critical, critical against the detention centers in Libya, but still I don't think they really said that Libya is not a safe country. Right? And obviously, uh, and what they say also is that it's a matter of national competency, com competencies. It's up to the member states to decide on these res rescue operations and, and so on. So when you say that uh, EU member states should be held responsible because we are composite in, in these three different ways. As I explained, I mean, what about the European Commission or EU? I mean, uh, what is, can that, can, can EU be held uh, responsible for these actions by the member states? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I just pass the floor to you and and I think I mean there were several questions to all of you and some to only some so yeah just answer okay. what you feel entitled to <laughs> okay I, I think I will start with the first question on Dublin so my first answer to that would be that um, although I also think that uh, the question of the future of Dublin is very important um, that in general the human rights obligations of the member states and also the obligations under the international law of the sea are independent or and also should be uh, well assessed independently of the question of whether the member states are able to find and to agree <coughs> on a on an internal distribution mechanism so that's that's an internal question but it does not at all uh, touch upon the international uh, obligations of the member states However, politically, of course, it's important uh, that to, to find a solution um, for the distribution of migrants and for the responsibility of, for protection within the European Union. Um, and I think there, um, 
I basically uh, would like to make three points. So the first um, was already mentioned by um, by Eric Marquardt, that it would be <coughs> very important to uh, include local communities here who are actually willing to take uh, more responsibility for uh, for refugees and migrants, and to uh, to find a legal framework in which they all effectively have the possibility to do so instead of uh, posing more obstacles for them. And the second um, possibility is uh, or is basically uh, already um, in place or partly in place with the Malta Declaration. So that would be to group or to find at least some member states who are willing to cooperate uh, in the distribution mechanisms and then to uh, put that mechanism in place uh, while the other member states are n not yet willing to, to join. And the third point is that we should also not forget to take into account also the, the relevance of the interests of the migrants themselves in, in such a situation and to enhance their mobility, their um, possibility to, to free movement within the European Union so that they can actually, well, go to a place where they uh, really have the feeling that they can can integrate well and which is most likely will most likely also be a region which is uh, well um, provides good reception conditions but also good uh, economic opportunities for them to to then uh, settle in that in that area um, maybe also a word on the on the package of questions uh, from uh, from ECRA. Um, so I would like to to focus here only on the on the last part of your question and and leave the rest for for Nora and uh, so uh, with respect to the um, to situate uh, to uh, Operation Sophia or the follow up uh, <coughs> operation. Well, I think certainly the member states cannot uh, uh, well cannot evade their in, their international obligations under the law of the sea once they are out there with military boats then they have the responsibility to uh, to rescue persons in distress uh, that's crystal clear and nothing has changed here the problem is um, of course they could say well we we simply go to another area of the of the Mediterranean uh, Mediterranean and uh, I'm, I'm not so sure whether this is feasible at all and whether there actually is an area where then uh, well they will never ever uh, uh, well, see any migrant in their uh, in their side in their in their side. But um, what what certainly is a problem is uh, what happens if the military boats of the EU, EU member states during that operation gain knowledge of uh, well migrant boats uh, in distress in the Mediterranean but simply ignore it because it's not yet in their sight. So uh, the concept uh, that has al also been applied in, in Australia with uh, it's beyond the horizon, so we don't see them, so we simply pretend that they are not there. So, so that is certainly a problem. Uh, and here I would always argue, it does not really matter how, uh, how the, the official state boats really uh, gained knowledge about uh, the existence of a situation in distress. They have to rescue uh, those person, and they have to, uh, well, proceed to the uh, to the um, to the to the sorry to the, site. to the site exactly. And um, yeah, I wanted to say something else, but now I lost the point. Anyway, <laughs> you can add it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So let me. Um, just maybe adding one point, um, of course, if we have the uh, mission keeping further away from migratory routes because the, the mission um, has changed, that uh, still leaves private vessels, um, merchant vessels, for example. It's not on. Have to use, uh, oh, no, it's not on. Sorry, I thought it was automatically on. Um, so just to repeat that point quickly, um, even if the uh, future um, or follow-up mission of Operation Sophia is going to stay away from the migratory route that still leaves merchant vessels um, in the Mediterranean and that also still leaves the search and rescue zones uh, in place. Um, so states, uh, EU member states who operate search and rescue regions will still have the uh, obligation to coordinate rescue missions to have uh, effective search and rescue capacities in place. So not everything depends on these missions, although of course they're very important. 
um, because they contribute to the absolute number of rescue um, vessels in the Mediterranean. Um, as to um, Frontex, yes, uh, I kind of left out Frontex because sort of from a law of the sea standpoint, not much changes, but you've um, hit on a very important, I think, topic. Um, with a Euro sewer uh, system, Frontex is now sharing um, information with third countries on um, movements um, in, uh, for example, the Mediterranean. Um, and if you've ever seen sort of uh, images of uh, sa uh, satellite images of the of the sea, and I think Eric can so say more about that, you can see a lot of what's moving in the Mediterranean. We know that um, Frontex is not only observing these movements, but is also giving early information um, to third countries saying there are there is irregular movement here, and can you address this? So that is, kind, that is one of the ways that we can get into these situations where Libya is called to a rescue scene. Um, in those cases, uh, we can also think about EU responsibility because Frontex now has legal personality, so um, we can talk about responsibility of this agency. Um, and of course, once Frontex will have its <coughs> own staff, um, that would also be EU staff and not just member state staff coordinated by Frontex. So there can also be responsibility of the European Union itself in those um, scenarios. Otherwise, as the gentleman over here um, stated, yes, of course, search and rescue is um, not an EU law matter. It hasn't been unionized. Um, however, a lot of... Um, Rescue missions will also occur in the context of border surveillance and border protection scenarios. And border protection is an EU matter. And that means the Schengen Border Code uh, applies, and that means the Charter of Fundamental Rights applies. Um, so this is governed um, then by EU law, even if it's not conducted as part of a Frontex operation. Um, so the, the European Union is implied, uh, implicated in those scenarios um, through its law as well. Um, you also asked about safe countries of, of origin and safe countries, safe third countries, um, and the safety standards are slightly different um, because they're focusing more on the question of refugee protection and human rights protection, but as we've seen, the definition of a place of safety um, under the law of the sea also contains those elements. So safety from persecution and from chain refoulement and, cha and safety uh, for um, life and limb uh, is, is part of those essential guarantees. So there is certainly a large amount of overlap between the concept of safe third country, safe country of origin, and safe pla uh, place of safety. Um, always this must of course relate to the individuals that are concerned. Um, let me say one more thing, uh, Josephine, you raised some very complicated issues on um, IMO's uh, decision to establish the SAR zone. I have thought about this as well. Um, I was wondering whether IMO should have rejected the SAR zone, saying that um, the Libyan forces should not be allowed to come anywhere near a rescue scene. However, um, uh, I think it might be worth thinking about this also from a different perspective because if you have those um, Libyan forces in place, they are of course bound by the international law of the sea. Um, they do proceed to the rescue, but they can't disembark in Libya. So if they refrain from um, endangering people during the rescue and deliver them to a place of safety, it would be fine. Um, so I think there are no, not enough grounds to call on IMO to um, sort of re reject this, uh, this statement, which I think is one that the state does itself and IMO simply <laughs> registers. Um, but um, that, is, that is still something to think about when um, uh, member states bound by the European Convention on Human Rights and by EU law come together in IMO uh, fora that they take their human rights responsibilities with them even when they operate within an international organization. We have um, case law both from the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Justice that confirms that. And that is certainly something to bear in mind. Should I add? Yeah. Uh, why not? <laughs> Want to add something? <laughs> yeah, the Dublin thing. I, I think you're completely right that it's not a, like, working system, but we have the Malta Declaration as a pilot project at the moment, and there is a situation that 
not only four member states in total, but some more member states contributing to this Malta declaration. Some will not go public about it because they are scared about their voters, whatever, I don't know. Um, but in the end, it does not help us if we say that we have a um, system which not works at the moment and therefore we do not respect human rights, we do not respect that and that and that and just stop working in the end. Yeah, I think if I like, um, every time I experience and like, unjust uh, experience in the parliament and uh, I would stop working completely, I would have a like, pretty relaxed time in the end. And I think that member states of the European Union also should know about their responsibilities. Maybe, yeah, working a little bit um, more together. For example, Italy was... Uh, now we have a situation where Italy is able to also work together with un other member states, but as you also said, we had a situation where the Italian government, also the Austrian and the Hungarian government, just were not partners, which like really made sense and to, to discuss with, because they actually did not want to solve a problem. Yeah, they just did not want it. We have numbers, like last year, uh, less um, then half of the number of people came to Italy from Libya, then we have actually at the moment only in Camp Moria on Lesbos. Yeah? That's like 11,000, I think, came to Italy. Um, I don't understand why we discuss this issue so much at the moment and just not find uh, some solutions for it. Thank you. Are there, are there more questions? We have one here and then one here. That's very handy. Hi, my name is. <coughs> uh, my name is Tarek Mahmoud. I'm a journalist. Uh, my question to uh, Mr. Marka uh, What about the state of play? Uh, political groups in the European Parliament. Uh, do you think regarding the uh, certainly regarding the uh, the subject, uh, uh, the refugees, the quotas, uh, distribution, all of this? Because the Parliament can, with the with the Treaty of uh, Lisbon, can uh, can do a lot. Thank you. So I'm Julia Lagana from the Open Society Foundation. Um, so I'd just like to follow up on uh, Josephine's question about Frontex. Um, a lot of people are pinning their hopes on a Strasbourg ruling, on uh, various incidents which have taken place which involve the, 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 pull the pullbacks by the Libyan Coast Guard. Um, and I'm just wondering in the quite likely possibly event of the ruling not going as we would wish it to go, um, what other avenues for litigation you see in the case of Frontex, for instance, or EU agencies or EU um, actors uh, taking on the active role of being involved in the pullback by the Libyan Coast Guard? Um, and then a sort of separate question, kind of channeling my inner Vincent Cochetel, uh, you know, the UNHCR <laughs> Special Envoy for the Mediterranean. Um, you've ruled out return or disembarkation in Tunisia, and I, I quickly read through the the report on, on that particular section uh, on a host of grounds, but there's a lot of, it keeps coming up uh, as the most likely candidate for a possible disembarkation platform or whatever. Um, and so far, the only thing I can see based on also my experience in Tunisia is the pushback by the Tunisian authorities themselves in terms of accepting this role. But what strong arguments can be made, you know, to, to you know, sort of put that proposition to rest forever? from the EU side, from the legal side, rather than just the political uh, bilateral <coughs> uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. There would be room for one more question. Mm -hmm. If you don't have one... Uh, uh, yeah, That's please, if you have a follow-up question. Uh, first, I wonder if I can conclude from your reply to my question uh, about competency. Is where the, is there a legal basis uh, <laughs> for the Commission to start, as was said, suggested by Eric, to start infringement procedures mm -hmm. against those member states who, especially Italy, it seems to have violated the, the law. 
And then another question, because you, you talked about the, what you displayed, the Sophia operation, and, and obviously what the Foreign Affairs Council decided uh, this week was that it would be replaced by some kind of military mission uh, to enforce uh, we the weapons embargo against Libya. And, and then we lot, 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 lot much talk about the so-called pull factor, that there is a presence of uh, this air vessels in Mediterranean would, let's say, act as a pull factor for migrants to try to cross the sea. And in that case, it was said that then the air would might withdraw those vessels. So what is your reaction to that? Thank you very much. Maybe? Yeah. OK, so um, we agreed that I will start with Tunisia. <laughs> Um, yeah, the difficult question, um, as I mentioned, uh, the situation in the North African countries is, uh, well, not ev not always comparable to the devastating conditions in, in Libya, of course. Um, I think, nonetheless, in uh, Tunisia, at the moment, one of the one of the strong arguments is that they still have no asylum system put in place. Maybe that's also part of their own uh, political strategy to, um, well, to block their role uh, that the European member states uh, would wish for. So um, that is one of the key points. But also the uh, the fact that for many vul vulnerable groups, the situation even in in Tunisia. It cannot be considered safe because they have no protection uh, against harassment, against uh, against abuse, against um, also state uh, pra practices of violence, and so on and so forth. So, um, while as I said, the situation might not be such that um, a disembarkation in Tunisia is unsafe for each and every person who is rescued in the Mediterranean, is it is certainly for many uh, an unsafe place. And um, the uh, member states, from the legal perspective, cannot tell uh, private rescuers uh, to, to disembark uh, persons in a, in a place where it is at least not for all persons that might possibly be rescued uh, really a place of safety. Because it's simply impossible to, to have a screening in that regard on, uh, on a private rescue boat. So how, how should that look like? So we ask them why, why they left Tunisia and then we bring them back. So that, is, that, that would be, uh, and, and the others we, we will bring to another place of safety. So that, that is not feasible. And um, of course, the, the boats who are actually rescuing persons in distress in the Mediterranean are not equipped neither uh, with the legal uh, personnel nor with the legal authority to actually uh, make that this, that situation. So uh, therefore, in the end, it will be a situation by the, in by the respective shipmaster whether they consider the, the state to really be a place of safety or not. And I would say if it's not a place of safety for all of the people that are rescued, then it cannot be considered a place of safety. If it was a member state ship, then uh, well, on even then, I would say that it's very, very difficult to have a, a, a screening on board because it requires a whole uh, administrative procedure, including the possibility to appeal. I don't see how that could actually be uh, operate on a on a ship on a vessel uh, in the Mediterranean. So I would say there are strong arguments. Uh, strong rule of law arguments why that cannot be a just procedure. Uh, and that would also be then the argument that has to be made both before the European Court of Justice and the European uh, Court of Human Rights that um, that uh, member states who well then bring people back with a well only uh, a mock procedure or something like that will violate their non the non reform law principle. Thank you. Um, for these questions. Maybe just to follow up on this and clarify um, one of my answers on the safe country of origin, safe third country, uh, because you mentioned Tunisia. 
Um, in the safe country of origin di discussion, for example, we are always considering individual cases. So we're looking at one individual person and we're assessing the risk for that person and we also have the opportunity, which you can criticize, but which is being used um, of getting diplomatic guarantees for this person from that state that this person will not be tortured if they are returned there. In the scenarios that we're describing, um, this is not what we can do. So you have to send people back without knowing um, whether or not they will be mistreated and you have to act sort of uh, on a risk assessment um, on more general factors. Um, so you, um, you asked about the infringement uh, procedures. Uh, I tried to find the, um, the provision on infringement procedures. I, it was, I couldn't find it so quickly. Um, and we haven't looked into this, but of course the infringement procedure um, would require that EU law has been violated by the member states. So this would have to be limited to certain scenarios where the member states are actually implementing EU law and thereby are bound by, say, for the Charter of Fundamental Rights, the Schengen Borders Code, um, Frontex um, regulations, which in all include um, the obligation to respect non refoulement um, and the European uh, Convention on Human Rights, as well as any other relevant international law, which includes international refugee law, law of the sea, and so on and so forth. Um, so um, as to possible other avenues, um, knowing that it's not going to be getting easier um, in Strasbourg, uh, at least for now, um, this is something, um, and thank you for this question, this is something that I've been thinking about for a while, actually, and have been writing about as well, um, that I think we have to also think about um, addressing UN fora um, rather than putting all of our eggs into one basket and trying to get the court to decide all these cases in favor of um, strong human rights protections when the court is becoming increasingly under pressure. Um, one way to go is to use the Human Rights Committee, which oversees the International Covenant on um, Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, which is a UN monitoring body, um, which accepts individual um, submissions and issues views on them. Unlike the court judgments, they're not binding, and um, that committee can also not award damages, which the court can do. Still, um, that is a forum that uses or that interprets human rights guarantees that are very similar to the ones that we find in the European Convention, and thus it can strengthen sort of a dialogue or sort of um, prepare the ground possibly for a court that may sort of find back its way to a strong um, human rights guarantees also in the Mediterranean. Um, that would also open up, for example, the possibility to um, discuss the right to leave any country, including your own, um, which has been included from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, up until the newest conventions in both general and specialized conventions. It's also contained in a protocol to the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and it's a, it's a key right because it secures um, the possibility to leave a situation where you're under threat. And it is um, a very, very important part um, of being able to access the guarantee of non refoulement because if you're not able to get to a frontier where you can then claim non refoulement and thereby access procedures to have your individual claim assessed and thereby possibly uh, gaining ent entry into some sort of asylum system, then you're never able to escape those, um, those um, persecutory systems. Um, and these pullback operations, I think, are a violation of the right to leave because there is no justification that is compatible with the human rights guarantees. I've, I've written a something on this, so um, this is very complicated. I don't want to go into the details now. Um, and finally, uh, have you, you haven't addressed the pull factor no. question, have you yet? No. Would you want to do? Yeah, uh, well, the pull factor, uh, well, first of all, there is, at least to my knowledge, no real evidence that, uh, no scientific ed evidence at the moment that uh, both the uh, private rescuers, but also the uh, well, state vessels in the Mediterranean actually are pull factors for migration. First of all, because uh, migration or to to get on a very unsafe boat with the slight chance to actually reach European shores is always a decision that is driven by many factors, by uh, also by a situation where you really. Uh, 
have the feeling that that you are in danger and that you have to go there so i i find it very likely uh, very unlikely that uh the mere factor that you might be rescued even uh, if, well, if there is, uh, the chance is probably higher that you're not rescued and that you would actually drown in the Mediterranean, that um, that this should then uh, really really produce such a such a pull factor. So from the uh, from the scientific side, I would say there's still no strong evidence for uh, for rescue operations to actually uh, produce pull factors. Yeah, like I know that everybody is discussing pull factors and since some right-wing conspiracy theory makers were able to put it in the middle of the discussion, uh, actually. Um, in the end, the whole discussion is about a situation where the European external borders must be more dangerous than a war zone like Libya. Otherwise, they will go somewhere. Like It's a really rational decision if the external border, if the like, um, way to Europe is more dangerous than the war in Libya, I will not go. But if it's not more dangerous than the war in Libya, I would maybe try to. And I don't understand why we have like, I, I don't have to agree with uh, Sebastian Kurz on everything, but I don't understand why like somehow at least um, smart, maybe smart person like Sebastian Kurz is really convinced of an argument where he want to have the European Union at uh, the external borders to be more like deadly and dangerous than a war like what is what is that in in the end like i i really don't understand why i have to uh, see it as a like valid argument or whatever it's like just inhumane and strange behavior of like um, adults in the end and um the other discussion is the operations of fear i like when i would be a weapon smuggler and i would know that the vessels from the new operation would not be there where the maybe uh, uh, there are some refugees. I think the area where the refugees are maybe like the search and rescue area is five times as big as Germany or something. And like if I would be a smart weapon smuggler or like I, maybe I don't have to be that smart, but I, I would just not go where the operation is, but where well, the refugees are from Al Algeria, Tunisia. I would like that's not like yeah, maybe you have to plan it a little bit, but I think it would be possible. And if you like are convinced that there is a weapon embargo and that the European Union is maybe um, somehow also responsible um, for the like some contribution in foreign policy in the world, then I would maybe say, okay, maybe it's not the biggest problem if we find people in distress and rescue them because we need to be everywhere somehow to see if there are some weapon smugglers because we don't want weapons to be in Libya. So I think there need to be some further also fact-based and reality-checked um, discussions about the new mission. Be I really don't understand why somebody can be like convinced that it's a smart thing to just avoid to be in like most of the central Mediterranean. I, I don't understand it. And um, the Tunisia, I, I just wanted to say one sentence on Tunisia because most of the things are said, but it's also very like European focused view. Tunisia received more than one million refugees from Libya, actually. Nobody's talking about it. Like, but everybody is talking about, oh, it's 11,000 people to Italy, not maybe too much. Should we maybe send them back to Tunisia? I think that's also a little bit, I would say, arrogant to not understand that Tunisia is also under pressure somehow. And that maybe it's also if, like not only legal point of view is clear, but also if you just want to make good like politics in the end, you should maybe keep in mind that there are also other states um, which are um, receiving refugees, having pr um, challenges, and which maybe need more support, more support and pressure at the moment. And um, yeah, um, Frontex, I, I just wanted to say uh, maybe I am able to do it in three sentences about the state of play at sea. Because, for example, this pre-screening discussion. Yeah, um, if you rescue people, I've been on on six sea search and rescue missions, and sometimes there's very very good weather, but most of the time you have, um, if you rescue a hundred people, 60 of them are seasick and like really seasick. And it's just not possible to talk to them for days. So it, it's just not possible. And you would 
need to have a translator, which is not seasick, and you need a refugee, which is not seasick, and um, just wait for some days there, make a pre-screening, then saying, okay, you, you go to, to the Tunisia group, please, and you, you stay here, and we now we go for four days to Tunisia, if the, if the weather allows it, and then we need five days to go to Spain, and then we have a like rotating harbor system, as uh, one foreign minister now said, like, Oh no, Di Maio said it. We need a rotating harbor system. And um, then you go to Spain for five days because the ways are pretty long, then to Italy and disembark there to any people. Say, like, w what is it all about? You can just like bring them somewhere, make a like procedure. And it's also a stupid idea to like the search and rescue operation is finished after the people are disembarked in a place of safety. So like in a search and rescue operation, which is not finished to make some pre-screening about some like that's like not convincing at all in the end, if you uh, have a realistic point of view there. And um, the state of play in the different groups in the parliament, I'm not an expert on all the insights on every group there, but I know that what I see is that um, I would say that um, most of the groups in the parliament are doing their homework. They thinking about new ideas, new approaches for the new debate on um, the new pact on asylum and migration. We will get a proposal from the commission in the beginning of April. And I think that most of the groups in the parliament are prepared for the discussion. And I would also think, uh, I, I also think that in the end, um, last time the parliament did the homework. It was like hard discussions, as I heard, I was not a member of parliament, but in the end we find some compromises and we did our homework and the discussion was stuck in the council for four years. And I would assume that um, if you care about a new pact for asylum and migration and some good new rules, um, uh, you need more pressure on the council than on the parliament because I think we are able to find compromises as we always are. Thank you very much. I would like to um, collect a last round of questions. Um, if there still are some, yeah, I see Zora. <laughs> Hello, my name is Zora Siebert. I also work for the Heinrich Böll Foundation. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Um, I have a question regarding the new pact on migration. What is to expect from the European Commission, I don't know if this going is going to be uh, a look into the glass ball or if some ideas are already out there. I hear from the panel that you know, fostering local authorities that are willing to accept refugees is could be a way forward, or to work with the member states who actually want to have um, a relocation mechanism. What is there to expect? Thank you, Zura. Are there other questions? No? <laughs> okay, otherwise I would have one. Um, you talked a lot on, um, well, on the fact that European member states are to be um, held responsible in case of complicity in third states breach of international laws. And I I would really like to know how. I mean, how would you, uh, how would you do that? Because the situation is is different. At the moment, as you also said, the Italian um, the Italian MRCC is working with the Libyan Coast Guards. Thank you. I can maybe say something um, for the Commission. I'm not the spokesperson of the Commission. I know that uh, some people here are from the Commission. Maybe they can um, say uh, what we can expect and uh, give us some hints and maybe a paper, which is already... I don't know. But um, what I expect from the Commission is that I, I would say that we have three big problems at the moment. That humanitarian crisis at the external borders, not only in, in not only in the central Mediterranean, but also on Lesbos islands. Stuff. So we need a system which does not create humanitarian crisis at the external borders or somewhere else in Europe. That's like one, one part of the challenge and I expect them to solve this problem. Second thing is this country of first entry as principle, which just does not work. You cannot change your position on the like geographical point from yeah, so that's like not a very just system in the end. And I 
also would expect that the European Commission keeps in mind that in the end there should be another system without the principle of first entry. And the third thing which is challenging is secondary movement in the end. Yeah, you are also connected to the Dublin discussion, but there are many people who do, don't stay in the countries where they should stay somehow. And that's basically because you don't um, yeah, you, you don't talk to the people and accept the links to different countries, their needs, and I think that in the end you have two decisions. You can put people to detention centers as long as they, like, some, like after years they maybe go away or after court decisions they can go away or like whatever. But that's one um, solution to just lock people up um, for like being a refugee in the end or a migrant or whatever. And the other possibility is to create a system where you uh, talk to people, talk like about about links, uh, family links, but also maybe language links and other stuff, and to organize that you have a system in the end where member states, um, yeah, uh, it is in the end maybe not the most important thing that every me member state receive uh, a quota refugee number of whatever, but that. Um, people have perspectives in the member states where they are because if they don't they will move away or you create other problems. Um, people without perspectives always a problem like independent from nationality or whatever. Um, yes, thank you. Maybe just uh, to follow up on the uh, on the possibilities that the Commission has now in restructuring its um, its approach to a common European asylum system. Um, I think something that we've I think already mentioned is um, there is a great willingness uh, on the subnational level to accept refugees, um, especially municipalities and cities that have just declared themselves cities of refuge have offered places to take uh, refugees from either other member states or to accept um, people rescued uh, in distress at sea. Um, and I think it would be um, important for the Commission to look into um, not just forging a coalition of the willing where there is no consensus on the entire uh, EU Council level, but to also open um, areas of flexibility for municipalities and cities of refuge stepping in. Uh, my colleague from the University of Hamburg, Heidi Nehoiza, has written on this and others have, of course, too. Um, there is also a plan that Gizi Nishvan has, uh, the uh, German um, politician, has been shopping around to um, prepare uh, a plan for a network of communities where um, they can uh, compete for um, funds from the EU that will not only benefit the people that they then accept, but also benefit the community at large by funding infrastructure projects, for example. There is a lot of ideas out there. It's just for the commission to pick up on them and um, make them and sort of build them into their plans in a way that maybe both um, provides room for the receiving communities to um, express solidarity and that also goes in the um, sort of in the direction of taking into account the interests of migrants and their actual opportunities to become part of the communities where they will be protected. Um, you also asked though, um, we're talking about breaches of international law, um, so now what? Um, and accountability is a whole nother question um, on top of questions of um, the situation under international law. How you can hold a state accountable is much more complicated um, than determining whether or not it violated its obligations. Um, for example, in the, in the international law of the sea, you can't just go to court and say, I am a person that was rescued in distress and they brought me to an unsafe place violating my rights because the law of the sea applies between states and they can hold one another accountable, but they can't be held accountable by individuals so far. We don't have individual complaints procedures like we have them in uh, the individual, uh, in the European Court of Human Rights, for example. Um, so it is more complicated, and that is, of course, why human rights are such an attractive area of law to address rescue scenarios, because it's so difficult to address them under the law of the sea. But I think it's still very important to understand that these guarantees apply and that um, states 
uh, do have obligations at sea and that even if the European Court of Human Rights might not expand, uh, further expand its, um, its case law in that direction, this doesn't mean that this is legal behavior. And for a European Union that takes pride in uh, being an area of the rule of law and upholding it and an area of um, pr the protection of rights, um, it is important um, to realize that certain policies are unacceptable under international law and that this is sort of there's a clash of your self-image with what you're actually doing. And that is something that can be used politically um, even if uh, you sort of can't start a court procedure. So I think there is value in stating violations of law even if you can't drag the country to court over them. So maybe so much for that. I, I would also like to maybe use the opportunity to say a little bit more about the Melilla court judgment because we haven't talked much about this, but maybe you want to answer. That would have been my first. next question, but please. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, just because we haven't talked that much about it here yet, um, the judgment has made huge waves, of course, um, in the refugee law community. It's um, probably you all know what it's about, but it's on pushbacks um, in the Spanish enclaves in Morocco, Ceuta and Melilla, um, which are protected by a series of three huge fences and um, a group of migrants um, managed to overcome these fences and land on Spanish soil and um, was then pushed back through the fences back to Morocco. Um, the European Court of Human Rights first in a chamber judgment um, found that this constitutes collective expulsion because it's collective, obviously it's a group, and it's expulsion because it comes from Spanish territory um, and Spain has jurisdiction over these people because they're physically being controlled by Spain. And um, the, the whole point of having a ban on collective expulsions is that secures the right to an individual risk assessment if you have an arguable claim that you may be mistreated and if you push people back without giving them a chance to say anything, um, then you're undermining central guarantees um, of non Um The Grand Chamber has now ruled um, in its judgment that this does not constitute collective expulsion um, because it has crafted a, an unwritten exception into that uh, provision um, saying that if you, if it's your own fault that you didn't get an individual procedure um, because you uh, tried to overcome the fences in mass using force and trying to overpower the forces there rather than using legal avenues that were available, then you can't rely on the ban of on collective expulsions. Now, um, I think we're in the process of negotiating what this judgment means. Um, it certainly means that this specific case, that these specific applicants lost their case in Strasbourg. The question is what else has the court decided and how will this play out in future scenarios? Um, to me, the grand chamber judgment, I mean, I'm, I, I'm shocked by a lot of what's in there. Uh, I'm very disappointed that it passed unanimously, that there were no dissenting opinions in this case uh, as they have been in past judgments. Um, but the, the judgment reads as a compromise. And you can kind of see how both sides negotiated certain language in there that can be picked up by the court in future judgments. For example, phrasing it such as uh, arriving in mass and using, using violence and overpowering the border forces, you can use that to distinguish a future case where this is not hap this is not describing the situation where it's sort of there's just a smaller group of people coming or they're not, they're not using violence they're just simply crossing the border um, you can also say that this is just sort of additional language on this case and this is a much broader exception and this will now apply to any border uh, crossing scenario outside of uh, of border crossing points um, so this is sort of part of where the the court has basically created new questions and of course our question is how will this apply to um, scenarios at sea. 
Um, can you maybe think of cases where refugees, or re I'm saying refugees, but sort of anybody then further uh, going into sea and, and being in distress can be told, well, if we're sending you back, it's your own fault because you shouldn't have gone to the ocean. Or you could have maybe gone to the embassy and asked for a protection visa. Uh, spoiler alert, there are no protection visas, um, which is also a case that's pending in court. So there is a lot of open questions here. But I think it's important to remember that the grain chamber judgment contains, I think in two or three places, explicit statements. This is a case on land borders. We're not deciding the hearsay scenario anew, which is also a grand chamber judgment, by the way. Um, so hearsay stands, and for now, um, we do not have a no law zone in the Mediterranean. Collective pushbacks in the Mediterranean have not become legal by this new judgment. Um, and we, and this is sort of, if in the media or in the discussion you are now encountering statements saying now collective expulsions are legal, pushbacks are now legalized by the court, that is a political statement. That is not what the court actually decided and we need to push back against those overly broad readings of this judgment. Thank you very much. Um, as I find it very complicated to sum up the discussion, I would like to ask you <laughs> to maybe, um, well, you two, Anushi and uh, Nora, maybe to, to sum up in one or two sentences, like the most important message uh, from the study. Um, and Eric, I would like to ask you to also, well, if that's even possible, <laughs> um, summarize a bit in two or yeah, one or two sentences um, what has to be done now. Okay, I think the most, most important uh, message for me is that member states under international law and under human rights obligations are not allowed to pass on their uh, responsibility and to circumvent the responsibility by strategies of extraterritorialization or by strategies where they rely on private persons to fulfill the dirty work that they don't uh, want to do and are not allowed to do themselves. And um, I think uh, also with a view to the judgment that Nora just, uh, just mentioned, I think one of the very crucial discussions that we will have in the future is um, how we can actually make a court case or a really successful claim regarding uh, that practices and strategies of extraterritorialization, that is an open field of political and also of legal discussions. But um, I think from a legal perspective, the most important point is that those strategies are unlawful and they should be labeled as unlawful no matter what the political discourse about immigration at the moment is. Thank you. That was two and a half sentences, I think. Okay, I'll be. I'll, I'll try to be short. Um, no, no. I, I, I was. I just mean, Anushi has summarized the the main legal findings. Uh, you can't avoid responsibility by just trying to outsource it. Um, I want to maybe pick up on a political um, spin of this um, because you may say, well, if we keep expanding or keep making it more difficult for EU member states to keep migrants away then that will just fuel populist tendencies in Europe and that will have a, a very negative effect and we kind of have to find ways to sort of keep uh, migrants out of Europe. Um, I think my colleague agrees with me um, that this is a, this is, the strategy is bound to fail. Backing down in the face of such populist um, <coughs> arguments is something that is destabilizing human rights um, guarantees, that is undermining the very protection um, that is at the center of EU law. Um, and it is also undermining our efforts in holding them accountable for their um, uh, destabilization of rule of law. So um, these making these concessions, um, I think will have a boomerang effect and un end up undermining the rule of law standards in Europe. How we treat those that are the most vulnerable in our, uh, in our societies and is an indicator of justice in democratic societies. And what we do at the borders reflects on who we are as the European Union and um, whether or not we uphold human rights. And we can't have it both ways. 
either we take human rights seriously or we get rid of certain obligations. And if we're not ready to do that, then we have to take them seriously. Thank you very much. Yeah, I um, wrote everything down on page eight and nine of the <laughs> 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 seven points. And as I, has, uh, as I have only two uh, or one sentence, I just wanted to say that I think in the end it's important that we find back as Europeans like back to our self confidence that we are like w that we want to be a place where human rights and dignity of people matters and it's not something from the past or whatever as you said accountability is always a problem and i think that the commission should also act if there is so much evidence that member states do not respect the rules which are given there i think there is also like the commission somehow responsible to find consequences as a guardian of a treaty. And I think that, for example, infringement procedures, nothing out of scope in this discussion. It's a very important point. Um, rules are broken there and that should have consequences in the European Union. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation, for your comments, for the discussion. Also, I want to thank you, the audience, for coming, for participating in the event and also for your questions and comments. Um, the study will be launched on our website now. <laughs> um, so you, will, you, you can find it uh, online on our website, which is www.eu.bl. Org. Otherwise, we also have hard copies um, in the entrance. And um, I think, well, at least for me, this uh, was a lot of food for thoughts. And uh, I hope it's the same for you. And I wish you a very nice afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you to, uh, thank you to Anna. <laughs> I did always moderate the things, but also moderate the whole process. That was great. Thank you. <laughs>